And now turn with me in your copies of God's Word to 1 Chronicles chapter 2. 1 Chronicles chapter 2. This is found on page 334 in the Bibles provided. 1 Chronicles chapter 2. We are this year making our way through the book of Chronicles. First and second Chronicles are together one book, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get to look at it uh, throughout this year. Uh, this book summarizes the entire Old Testament with an eye particularly uh, to the, uh, the peoples of Israel and Judah who were permitted to return from exile to their homeland. And so that meant that uh, things that uh, God, God was concerned with, he wanted to put on their hearts. Uh, he wanted to con them concern themselves with reformation. He wanted to concern themselves with returning to the word of God. And those are still concerns for us today. Uh, how should we see the reformation that God would desire in the church? How should we return to the word of God? Well, we find it uh, even in this book. And uh, as we talked about last week, it's not just a list of names, although we're going to hear many of them this morning. Uh, but this is the word of God. There's instruction here. And particularly as this is a long chapter of, of names, I'm going to ask the, or I'm going to pray first that the Lord would give us extra grace uh, to receive uh, what he has written here for our instruction as we turn ourselves to the, ten, to the, to the, uh, the reading and preaching of God's word. And so I'm going to pray first, then I'm going to read, and then we'll, we'll continue on with the sermon. Lord, we pray that you would uh, give us uh, attention, Lord, the Lord, cast out of our minds those things that might distract us. Uh, Lord, that we would, uh, we would see that this list of names is, a, is a instruction from you. Uh, Lord, that we would hear every word from your mouth. And Lord, that you would give us your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. These are the sons of Israel. Reuben. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The sons of Judah, Er, Onan, and Shelah. These three, Bashua, the Canaanite, bore to him. Now Er, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death. His daughter-in-law, Tamar, also bore him, Perez and Zerah. Judah had five sons in all. The sons of Perez, Hezron, and Hamul. The sons of Zerah, Zimri, Ethan, Heman, Calcol, and Dara, five in all. The son, son of Carmi, Achan, the troubler of Israel, who broke faith in the matter of the devoted thing, and Ethan's son was Azariah. The sons of Hezron that were born to him, Jeremiel, Ram, and Shelubai. Ram fathered Aminadab, and Aminadab fathered Nashon, prince of the sons of Judah. Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, Jesse fathered Eliab, his firstborn, Abinadab the second, Shimea the third, Nethanel the fourth, Radai the fifth, Ozem the sixth, David the seventh. And their sisters were Zeruiah and Abigail, the sons of Zeruiah, Abishai, Joab, and Asahel, three. Abigail bore Amasa, and the father of Amasa was Jether, the Ish Ishmaelite. Caleb, the son of Hezron, fathered children by his wife, Azubah, and by Jeriot, uh, and these were her sons, Jether, Shobab, and Ardon. When Azubah died, Caleb married Ephrath, who bore him Hur. Hur fathered Uri, Uri fathered Bezalel. Afterward, Hezron went in to the daughters, daughter of Machir, the father of Gilead, whom he married when he was 60 years old, and she bore him Segob. And Segob fathered Jair, who had 23 cities in the land of Gilead. But Geshur and Aram took from them Havoth, Jair, Kenot, and its villages, 60 towns. All these were descendants of Machir, the father of Gilead. After the death of Hezron, Caleb went into Ephrathah, the wife of Hezron, his father, and she bore him Ashur, the father of Tekoa. The sons of Jeremiel, the firstborn of Hezron, Ram, his firstborn, Buna, Oren, Ozem, and Ahijah. Jeremiel also had another wife whose name was Atara. She was the mother of Onam, 
the sons of Ram, the firstborn of Jeremiel, Maaz, Jamin, and Eker, the sons of Onam, Shammai, and Jada, the sons of Shammai, Nadab, and Abishur. The name of Abishur's wife was Abihail. She bore him Achban and Molid. The sons of Nadab, Seled and Aphaim, and Seled died childless. The son of Aphaim, Ishi. The son of Ishi, Sheshan. The son of Sheshan, Achlai. The son of Jada, Shemai's brother, Jether. Sons of Jada, Shemai's brother, Jether and Jonathan. And Jether died childless. The sons of Jonathan, Pelet and Zaza. These were the descendants of Jerachmiel. Now Sheshan had no sons, only daughters, but Sheshan had an Egyptian slave whose name was Jarcha. So Sheshan gave his daughter in marriage to Jarcha, his slave, and she bore him Atai. Atai fathered Nathan, and Nathan fathered Zabad. Zabad fathered Ephlal, and Ephlal fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jehu, and Jehu fathered Azariah. Azariah fathered Helez, Helez and Helez fathered Eliasach. Eliasach fathered Sismai, and Sismai fathered Shalum. Shalum fathered Jechmiah. Jechmiah fathered Elishama. The sons of Caleb, the brother of Jeremiel, Mareshach, his firstborn, who fathered Ziph. The son of Mareshach, Hebron. The son of, sons of Hebron, Korah, Tapuah, Rechem. And Shema. Shema fathered Racham, and the father of Jochiem, and Rechem fathered Shammai. The son of Shammai, Maon, Maon fathered Beth Zur. Ephah, also Caleb's concubine, bore Haran, Moza, and Gazez, and Haran fathered Gazez. The sons of Jahdai, Hegem, sorry, Regem, Jothan, Geshan, Pelet, Epha, and Sha'ath. Macha, Caleb's concubine, bore Shever and Tirhana. She also bore Sha'ath, the father of Madmanach. Sheva, the father of Machbenach, and the father of Gibeah. And the daughter of Caleb was Aksa. These were the descendants of Caleb. The sons of Hur, the firstborn of Ephrathah. Shobal, the father of Kiriath Jarim. Salma, the father of Bethlehem, and Haref, the father of Beth Gader. Shobal, the father of Kiriath Jerim, had other sons, Haroech, half of the Menuchot. And the clans of Kiriath Jerim, the Ithrites, the Puthites, the Shamathites, and the Mithraites, from these came the Zoraites and the Eshtaolites. The sons of Salma, Bethlehem, the Netophathites, Ashroth, Beth, Joab, and half of the Menahathites, the Zorites, the clans of also of the scribes who lived at Jabez, the Tirathites, the Shimeathites, and the Sukkothites. These are the Kenites who came from Hamat, the father of the house of Rechab. And then just so we know where we're at, chapter 3 begins, these are the sons of David. And so ends the reading of God's word, and all his people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, wait, we already prayed. Let's start the sermon. <laughs> um, all right, uh, congregation, uh, we've, we've heard a lot of names. And this is particularly regarding the, the, the tribe of Judah. That was the, the tribe that was to rule, the, the, the kings uh, that, whose line uh, this book of Chronicles follows. We might ask, from this, uh, from this list of names, what does this tell us? What is this instructing us in? Well, a bit of that emphasis we're going to get as we continue on through the book of Chronicles. So we're going to have to read some of that back in here. But a chief question for us is, what does it take to have a great leader? If this is the ruling tribe, if this is the, the tribe of kings, the kings of David that uh, are, are the concern of the, the rest of the book of Chronicles, well, what does that tell us about a good king? What does that tell us about a king that God chooses to, to have lead us? Is, is a good king defined by his, uh, his keen sense of politics, by his, uh, uh, his uh, capacity to win on the battlefield? Uh, does, he, uh, does he have a military prowess? Does he have charisma that people just look up to him? Is he head and shoulders above the rest? What is it that should be our concern as people of God 
when we're thinking about those who would rule over us, those who would be uh, our leaders, whether in the church or in nations, or uh, who would we value as good leaders of families. This is instructive for all of us. And what it's telling us about is that while there's many things that the world looks at in their leaders, what should concern us is repentance. It's calling, uh, this passage is actually calling us to repent and follow God's chosen leaders. And so let's, let's get in this passage. Now, as we uh, turn to this, uh, this chapter, we see that this, uh, while, while the first chapter was telling about the, the, all the nations of the earth, how they came to be, all descending from Adam, this one's focusing in on the nation of Israel or the people of God uh, from, who, who were sons of uh, a- Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, particularly the sons of the promise. And these, uh, these are talked about as 12 tribes. And in, fr- in fact, for the next uh, several chapters, uh, this, there are nine chapters of genealogies at the beginning of, the beginning of Chronicles. The rest of the chapters that follow are all going to be talking about one or two of these tribes. And so this is instructing us how we are to look at those tribes. And the interesting thing is, even as we see the order of the, son, the sons were born, at least the first few, uh, these are the sons of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, is that those firstborns aren't mentioned. They're not the first, or they're, they're not that they're not mentioned, they're not the first genealogy that we come to. The first one we come to is Reuben. And so the question inevitably should be asked, why, why is Judah the first one that's given here? Or really, as we read through the rest of the book of Chronicles, why does this book of Chronicles, in distinction from the book of Kings, why does it concern itself with all the kings of following David's line? These are Judahite kings. Uh, kings from this tribe of Judah. It concerns itself with a southern kingdom instead of the northern kingdom. That is a big question. And why why is this tribe get so much concern? I mean, he gets, uh, you begin here in chapter 2, it's all about Judah. These are all names of people descended from Judah. Chapter 3, descendants from Judah as well. First half of chapter 4 as well. So you get two and a half chapters all about Judah. But Naphtali, poor Naphtali only gets one verse. That's second, or that's First Chronicles seven thirteen. So why, why, Judah here? Why not? What about Reuben, Simeon, and Levi? Well, um, that's a concern uh, that we might have just intellectually. But I want you to think about the first hearers of this book. Remember that the book of Chronicles is written around the same time as the book of Ezra. People are coming out of exile. And so you have people from the southern kingdom. You have Judahites and Benjaminites and maybe the, the Levites and, and the, uh, the Simeonites that were sprinkled in there. They're coming out of exile. But you've also got Reubenites, Simeonites, Levites. You've got people from these northern kingdoms. And they're saying, why are you telling me a book about a kingdom I wasn't in? Why are, why are you emphasizing Judah over my own tribe? That's a real good question. Uh, I mean, often today people, people talk about uh, things as only being interesting if they have some kind of connection to themselves. Like I, if I'm, uh, you know, you see this in, in trends of like, like feminism. So, so a feminist might want to only read a book by women. Uh, and, uh, and you see this in some racial theories that I, I can only read a book that's about my race. You, you might think about these Reubenites and these Simeonites and Levites thinking, well, what about my people? What about my tribe? And it's kind of like a slap in the face. See, this begins not with your tribe, even though you were the oldest ones, but this is from your younger brother. This is from the other kingdom that you weren't a part of. And so that should really strike us as we turn to this chapter. Why is that? Well, the first answer to this question, at least regarding Judah's older brothers, is that they're not first, even though they were born first, they're not first in this genealogy because of their sin. And this is uh, drawing us back to remember what was prophesied by Jacob, by Israel is, uh, is what God renamed him, by Jacob in, uh, in his dying words, Genesis 49. He said of his firstborn, of Reuben, you shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. You went up to my couch. Now, what's he talking about? Jacob's obviously mad about something, isn't he? What was it? Well, it's, we read of it in plain language in Genesis 35, 22, and it's sin. Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. Now, that's 
That's, that's not him going and having relations with his own mother, but it is, a, it is, according to God's law, it is a form of incest. God forbids such a thing. Yes, I'm, I'm talking about strange things, and this is, the, this is the people of God, and there are sins such as this listed here in, this geneal, or in their genealogy. God passed Reuben by for his sin. Well, then we might ask about, well, Simeon and Levi, they're they're in the next ones, right? So what about them? Well, Jacob, again, in Genesis 49, as he's blessing his, his, his 12 sons, he says, let not my soul come into their counsel. Oh, my glory, be not joined to their company, for in their anger they killed men. What was Jacob talking about? Well, friends, there's a sad story that one of Jacob's daughters, sister to the 12, Dinah by name, was raped by a man named Shechem. A horrible sin, a wicked, wicked crime. But what did Simeon and Levi do to that man, that evildoer? Well, they took vengeance not only on him, on Shechem, but his whole family. And all the men of his city, they, they killed and slaughtered as many of those people as they could. And so what were they doing? Well, they were, they were not giving the justice that God's law requires, but they were sinfully overly vengeful. That's Genesis 34 when we read that. And so those two sons were passed by as well. And thus Judah, even though the the firstborn was the son Jacob blessed and prophesied to rule. Jacob prophesied regarding Judah, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your father's son shall bow down to you. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And by the way, let's remember that that's not just a, a father who's mad about things that his sons might have done to him or, 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 or not done to him. This is God's prophecy. Uh, God chose Judah. We sang of it earlier in Psalm 78. Uh, he rejected the tent of Joseph, but he chose the tribe of Judah. And so think of what this book is doing to sons of Israel who were descended from those northern ten tribes. Well, you've been in exile for longer than the southern southern kingdom. You've been uh, in exile for 150 years longer. But in coming out of exile, you need to face the fact that your whole tribal identity was built on rebellion. Judah did get the, the right of the firstborn. He was to wield the scepter, and your your ancestors rejected his rule. And if that's your default thinking, you need to repent. This, This book of names is calling them to repent and embrace the king that God had chosen, that God had set. Friends, how humbling this word is. It's telling of people, you descended from men who committed murder and incest. You were exiled for being a nation that had rebelled against the king whom God had chosen. That's what happened to the northern kingdom. Don't you understand? And yet, to be honest, that's not just the story of some tribes in some land across across the globe, but that's actually the story of every nation. We all have rebelled against the king that God has chosen. We all have, uh, we're all descendants from Adam, a sinner, a rebel. We're all, uh, we're all by nature sinners. We're all born at enmity with God, not wanting the, the king that he chooses, not wanting Jesus Christ and the good things of God. We're at, at born wanting ourselves to be king. We want to be king, God. And so this is a humbling word to us as well. Friends, many people want to re- hide from this reality because it is so hum- hum- humiliating. They don't want to come to Jesus because they would have to repent. They would have to admit that they are men and women of unclean lips and that we live among a people of unclean lips. And so just as just this list of names is a call to Reubenites, Simeonites, Levites, all the other tribes, even all nations, to repent and to trust in God's chosen king. Uh, Furthermore, this list of names reminds us that God's promises and actions, even if they took place hundreds or thousands of years ago, they still matter. Uh, We live in a world where people think, well, I want to make things matter how I want them to matter. You know, I'm the one who defines my reality. This is America. I can do whatever I want, right? Well, no. We live in God's world. 
And God is the one who raises one, puts down another. This is where, where we need to humble ourselves, repent before God, and recognize that what he, the ways he, he has set, those are the ways that must be. And we must either turn and repent and join him in his ways, or, or we will be rebels still. This, is a, this list of names is, is really chronicling who is Israel, who's truly a son of Jacob. And if you're a Reubenite who says, I don't want to have anything to do with Judah, you're saying, I don't want to have anything to do with the God of Jacob. I don't want to have anything to do with the God who sets, set this king, this tribe, aside for himself. And I don't want to have anything to do with the king ultimately that comes from this line. That's an interesting thing, all those things in this genealogy so far. But let's, let's keep going. Because uh, even as I mentioned that uh, those, those older tribes, uh, the Reubenites, the Simeonites, the Levites, those, those older sons were rejected for their sin, immediately they might turn as they read this genealogy and say, well, is Judah any better? Friends, did you catch how even in reading this list about Judah that some of his sins and even, even maybe we might say maybe it's just guilt by association, but even offspring of his, there's sin in here. There's sin in here, in, in Judah's line. Well, look at verse 3. The sons of Judah are Er, Onan, and Shelah. These three, Bathsheba, the Canaanite, bore to him. Well, first that's telling us that he married a Canaanite. He didn't uh, do as, as we're instructed to do, to marry only in the Lord. This was a contemporary problem for those original readers of Chronicles. They had intermarried with unbelieving nations, and God was saying those marriages are wrong. It was wrong to do that. It was wrong to bind yourself to someone who is against your God. Friends, it is wrong for, for us. Now, I want to speak to uh, particularly people here, young, young, young Christians. If you're not married, this is a word for you this morning. Whom you marry is important to God. And we often just, a lot of people will tell you that marriage is something you just, just marry whoever you love, wherever your heart leads you. Well, your heart is desperately wicked, God tells us. Okay, a lot of people will tell you marriage is just to make you happy, so just find someone that will make you happy. Well, that's not the way that God made marriage. God made marriage to make you holy. God made marriage so that you would have someone who would walk alongside of you that where you fall, that one would lift you up, and where they fall, you'd lift them up as you march toward God, as you live your life for His glory. That's what marriage is for. And so I want you to hear 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be unequally yoked. Who you marry matters to God. It's shown right here in this list of Genealogy, this list of names, a warning to us. Uh, Judah married an unbelieving Canaanite, and what came of that marriage? Well, we're told it right here in this genealogy, not all the details. Some of those we have to go back to Genesis 4, but we read that Er, his firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, how, how bad could he be? I mean, what did he do wrong? Well, apparently he was so evil that God put him to death. That's how seriously God took his sin. This was a wicked son. And by the way, his second son, we know a bit more detail about, began Genesis 38. Uh, Onan, his brother, would not fulfill his duty to raise up offspring for his brother. Now, this regards a law that we might think is a little bit weird today. Because uh, Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, God said that if your brother dies and he has a wife and he doesn't have any children, then you need to take care of his widow. But particularly how you're to do that is you're to provide her with offspring. That is, you were to have intercourse with his widow, and that child who would be produced from, from that was to be legally the son of your dead brother. Now, again, that sounds weird to our eyes. It sounds uh, even uh, like it might uh, contradict uh, God's law with incest, but it doesn't. It, it's, a, it's a specific law God, God gave. Why did he give it this way? Well, it's because inheritance was passed down through, through men, through from fathers to sons. And so if, if there's a widow who has no son, she's going to lose everything she has. This was a way to provide for her, to care for the widow and the orphan. God cared enough to make a law that might sound weird to us because he cares for the poor. And so he would have Onan care for the poor, his, his brother's widow, Tamar. But what did Onan do? Well, he pleased himself 
and let what was her due, what was to provide for her, fall to the ground. And so the Lord put him to death as well. Now, you know, Judah's, uh, Judah's got a tainted name already, doesn't he? He's married an unbeliever. His first two sons were wicked and died. And, and so here, Judah, how does he respond to all this? Well, he does something else that's not right. He, that law, Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, it was still his duty for his third son to provide offspring for, for their dead brother. And yet Judah stood in the way. He said, I'm not going to give you my son. I'm not going to let him fulfill the law of Deuteronomy 25. I'm not going to let him do what he should do to provide for this widow, my own daughter-in-law. And so what was Tamar to do? Well, she had a right that God had bestowed on her that Judah was denying her, and so she did what she could. She dressed as a prostitute, as a harlot, and she got pregnant with twins. And before you think of how bad she was for doing that, if, if, you, if you turn back to that story, you'll find that her own family finds out, and, and they're, they're ready to stone her for this. As soon as that's revealed, though, who the father is, the table is turned on Judah. Because Judah was the one who impregnated her. Again, when we hear about Judah, this is not, I mean, this is not someone you'd name your son after. Judah apparently... Uh, with pockets full after, he, after the selling of sheepskins, he would go and hire prostitutes. Not a paradigm of virtue. How starkly contrasted he is to, if you're reading through that narrative, he's, he's put right next to Joseph. Joseph is, is being tempted by his master's wife, and she's saying, come lie with me. And he's saying, how could I dare do something against God? right against that paradigm of virtue is Judah. Think of all that we've even talked about so far. And you might, you might be thinking, especially if you're a Reubenite, you're thinking, okay, we couldn't be kings because of our sin, but Judah did all this. And you might be thinking, and, and particularly if you're, maybe if you're a Judahite, you're thinking, boy, are we... Our, our ancestor did all this, these terrible things. How could he possibly be a holy man? How could he possibly be right with God? And so we see that this list of names is not just about this person, that person, that person, that person. This list of names is about sin and forgiveness. This list of names is ultimately about how are we forgiven our sins? What does that look like when a person has been forgiven and they know themselves to be a sinner? And ultimately, this is telling us that this is about repentance. Because Judah, for all his faults, we find in here, if we look back at that Genesis story, we find that Judah repented. Now, if you, again, if you read back that second half of Judah, maybe you're reading through the Bible in the, the, Bible in the year, maybe you're already reading through those, those, those latter chapters in Genesis, and you're thinking, boy, this is all about Joseph. Pay attention, because there's a number of times that Judah shows up in the middle of this story that you think is all about Joseph. And some of the most prominent times that Judah shows up are one, one I already mentioned. That's already alluded to in this genealogy, Judah's two older sons, they, they're put to death. Judah demised Tamar, his daughter-in-law, his daughter-in-law, her right to a son. She dresses up as a harlot. He he gives her twins. Um, you look at all that, and you see sin, sin, sin. But we also see in that in that passage, Genesis 38, that Judah opens his eyes to his sin. All this is found out. All of this comes to comes comes to the front. And what does Judah say? He says, Genesis 38, 26, she, that is Tamar, my daughter-in-law, who you know, dressed as a prostitute and, and uh, 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 you know, um, deceived me, he says, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give to her my son, Sheila. We see here in, in Genesis 38, when we look back at this man, Judah, is that yes, he's a man full of faults. Yes, he's a man full of sin. But we see the beginnings of the work of repentance in his life. 
the beginnings of a sinful man who's been changed by the, the gospel that was preached to Abraham, preached before uh, Christ, the good news uh, that there is forgiveness of sins. And so he sees that he is more sinful than an apparent harlot. We see that he uh, recognizes as much. He looks back on those things that maybe he thought he had good motives. You know, people often look at the, even the things that they've done wrong and say, well, you know, I tried to do the best thing. Judah can't do that anymore. He sees that what he did was wrong in the sight of God. It was a violation of his holy law. And he says, I, I was sinful here. I was, she is more righteous than I. Friend, have you had this beginning work of grace in your life? Friends, repentance, as we're seeing it here, is not just foundational to being a leader, whether it be over, the, over a nation or over the people of God and the church. This is not just foundational to uh, as if it's a, a second level of being a Christian. This passage is telling us that repentance is, what being, what is, is foundational to the Christian life. You can't be a part of this genealogy and not get repentance. Repentance. Have you repented? Has God opened your eyes to your sin? As you're broken over it. Has God opened your eyes to your sin to see his holiness? Now, to be clear, God didn't choose Judah because he repented. Rather, this is evidence that, that, that he repented is evidence that God had chosen this tribe. God had set him aside as a picture of of what it is to truly be a leader, a, a righteous leader in God's sight. But that was just the beginning of Judah's journey. He repented, but we see him also contrasted to Reuben later in the narrative. You see, the ten brothers uh, suffered famine. You know, there's famine going on in Canaan. They have to go down to Egypt buy grain. And who do they go when they, they go down there? Who, who do they meet when they go down there? They see Joseph, that brother that they had sold into slavery, but they don't know it's him. And here he's suddenly, a, he's this ruling, commanding guy in, over all of Egypt. And what does he do? He treats them severely, accuses them of being spies. He says, you got to go back and bring your, your other brother. And they're saying, well, we can't bring our other brother because like, our father would just die if, if anything happened to this other brother. Because he had, also, he had lost his blood brother, full blood brother, Joseph, uh, that they had sold into slavery. And so uh, what happens? How are uh, the... The, 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 the famine goes on. They need to go back to Egypt. They need to go back to Joseph, this man that said, you need to bring your brother. They can't, they can't go unless they bring Benjamin with them. And so Reuben makes an offer. Well, Reuben tries at this. He says, kill my two sons if I do not bring back Benjamin to you. And in a sense, that sounds like a weighty pledge. You know, I'll sacrifice two of my sons for you, one of yours. Although it makes me wonder, you're just going to offer to kill two of your sons? Uh, what kind of a father are you? Um, but Judah has had more time for this work of repentance to be working in his heart. He's confessed himself to be a sinner, and so he willingly offers, offers not his sons, not someone else that's dear to him. He offers himself. Genesis 43, he says, I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require it. You shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. But the plot thickens when they get back to Egypt and Joseph actually sets a trap for them. And so uh, Benjamin ends up being put in jail. Uh, Joseph's looking to see, are my brothers changed? Are they going to treat Benjamin the same way they treated me? Are they going to leave him to rot in this grave or in this, uh, in this jail cell? And so Joseph is or sorry, Judah is the, is the one of all the brothers who stands up and he says, how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your, of your servant. You see, Judah has become Godward in his repentance. God has found out our guilt. Guilt of all the ten brothers in, seal, in selling Joseph as a slave. Guilt of Reuben's incest. Guilt of Simeon, Levi's uh, a murder. A guilt of ignoring God's command to marry only in the Lord and protect, providing for widows. God has found all this out. God knows our sin. So they go on, Genesis 44, 33. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back to his brethren. So Judah has been humbled to see his life as forfeit. He has been driven out of himself. He no longer cares for his own pleasure, his own estate, his own life. 
He says, take me, it's not him. Friends, greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Brothers and sisters, this brings us then to the legacy of Judah. And so why do we get three chapters of, of Judah, of his relations, his ancestor, or his genealogy, his offspring? Well, it's because from this line comes the, the, the king whom God has sent. You see, it wasn't just Judah laying down his life for Benjamin and for his other other brothers at the same time. It was Jesus who ultimately laid down his life for his brothers as he gave himself to be nailed to a cross. He gave himself to be speared in the side. He gave himself to be crowned with thorns and scourged and hated by all men. He gave himself that we who believe in him might have life. Friends, do you recognize that it's through Jesus that we are connected to this list. If we have no share in Jesus, the son of David, the son of, son of Judah, this is all just a bunch of names that really condemn us. But if you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus, that great king who has come of this line, who has repented, or who didn't need repentance for his own sins, but if you repent and trust in him, then this is your heritage. This is your, this is your family. This is who you are. You are the family of God. You are adopted into his family. And yes, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're perfect. Did you, did you hear about some of these people? And so don't think that, well, well, I'm too sinful. I could never be in the family of God. This is, a, this is a family that's messed up. This is a family of sinners. But what's, what's common to all of them? It's that they've repented. It's that they've trusted in the king whom God sent. And so we're going to see then uh, the next two chapters that the, the, this, narr this focus narrows not just to, to, Jake, uh, sorry, to Judah and his tribe, but even more so to David. Uh, David's mentioned here, but there's a whole chapter on his genealogy, next chapter. And uh, even as we look at the rest of the book of Chronicles, there's, there's going to be a, a t following the line of David, those kings that followed him. And, and it, this, this idea of repentance is going to come up again. Judah repented. David repented. We're going to see kings of David's line. Some of them are wicked, and they didn't repent. But some of them were wicked like Manasseh. And we're going to read in Chronicles something that we don't find in Kings. That even Manasseh repented. So we're going to see that highlighted theme that a leader of God's people, a leader that God chooses, is one who repents. And so that brings us then to think about what does this tell us about us? Who are the leaders that we should choose as we're thinking of maybe leaders of our nation? Who are the leaders that we should choose if we're thinking about elders? We're praying right now, congregation, aren't we? For God to provide elders for this congregation to sustain us. For, for thinking, what, what, what do we need? Well, we need to repent. And, and by the way, it's not just, okay, we need to find one of us who's repented. We all need to repent. But we, we need the mature, the most, what God's design is, is that the most mature among us, the ones who would lead us would be examples of this, that they would know themselves to be sinners. But they know that there is forgiveness for all who trust in Jesus Christ, for all who repent and confess their sin. We're not looking for perfect people uh, because none of us is. We are looking for those whom God has set apart to lead us from in repentance, who will exemplify, even, even as, as Judah did, boy, a, a sinful man, but he recognized his sin before God and he confessed it. And it, made, it changed his heart, it changed who he was. And so may it be with all who would trust in him, uh, his son, Jesus Christ, that we would all repent and follow God's chosen leader and indeed all whom he has set uh, in him to rule over us. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this word. We thank you that, Lord, you, you don't hide from us the sins of our forefathers in the faith. 
Well, then I'm glad you didn't because if, if, if you just dressed this up and, and made it look like a list of people that always did the right thing, I would be without hope. We would all be wondering how we could possibly compare. But the truth is you are the God who forgives sin and iniquity. And that doesn't happen without changing the person. You do bring all whom you have chosen, all who will be yours to repent, to see their sin, to trust in you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do that work of conversion, do that work of of opening our eyes to our sinfulness and opening our eyes to seeing Christ once for all sacrifice for sin. That you would be glorified. Lord, we also pray that you would uh, provide for us leaders. Lord, may all of us be growing in repentance. Indeed, that, that we would value among, uh, among, our, among the body here, among uh, this church, people who know themselves to be sinners, people who, uh, who are humbled, uh, people who, uh, who love you all the more because you alone are the forgiver of sin. And so, Lord, we pray that you would provide for us uh, richly. Uh, Lord, make, a, make the leaders of our families, make, a, make our husbands and, and wives, make them to be those who demonstrate repentance. Uh, Lord, glorify yourself by letting this line, this, this tribe whom you have chosen, uh, uh, Lord, that we would choose this, this, this one as our king with our whole heart. And follow, uh, follow Judah, follow David, follow Manasseh in repentance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.